Hey everyone, welcome to, or for those who know the channel, welcome back to the Past Crimes channel. Firstly, I thought I'd say thank you to all those who subscribe to my channel, thank you. I really appreciate it very much. Now I know some of the regulars might be asking, what the hell is this? Well, I chose to do this mini intro for a reason. I'm just getting a bit annoyed with these comments of AI and robot voice, so this is just to show those commenters how, how it's really, really done. done. That's, That's if, if they, they catch on. Anyway, let me not bore you too much, and let's get to it. In the gritty underworld of organized crime, one name struck fear into the hearts of many, James Burke, infamously known as Jimmy the Gent. Born into the streets of New York City, Burke navigated the treacherous world of the Lucchese crime family with unparalleled cunning and ruthlessness. He forged alliances and orchestrated daring heists that left law enforcement baffled and his enemies trembling. But behind the facade of wealth and power, lurk a man consumed by paranoia and violence, ultimately leading to a downfall that would seal his legacy as one of the most notorious figures in mob history. According to records from the Manhattan Foundling Home, Jimmy was born on July 5, 1931, to a woman named Conway. By the age of two, he was classified as a neglected child and placed in the Roman Catholic Church's foster care program. Over the next 11 years, he was shuffled in and out of numerous foster homes. Psychiatric social workers later revealed that during this time, Jimmy experienced a range of treatment, including beatings, sexual abuse, pampering, deception, neglect, verbal abuse, confinement in closets, and kindness from various sets of temporary parents. As a result, he struggled to remember more than a few of their names and faces. Two months after the accident, he was arrested for juvenile delinquency, charged with being disorderly in a Queen's playground. Although the charge was later dismissed, the next year, at the age of 14, he was arrested for burglarizing a house near his foster home and stealing $1,200 in cash. He was sent to the Mount Loretto Reformatory, a juvenile jail for incorrigible youngsters on Staten Island. Serving time in Mount Loretto was almost seen as a badge of honor among the youngsters with whom Jimmy Burke had begun mingling with. In the month of September 1949, Jimmy was arrested for attempting to pass $3,000 worth of fraudulent checks in a Queen's bank. Due to his youth and innocent appearance, Jimmy had been utilized as a passer by Dominic Chirami, a Bensonhurst Brooklyn Hood who led a gang of professional check cashers. In the squad room on the second floor of the 75th Precinct in Queens, detectives handcuffed Jimmy and began punching him in the stomach, hoping to coerce Jimmy into implicating Chirami in the scheme. Despite the beating, Jimmy refused to talk. He was subsequently sentenced to five years in Auburn for bank forgery at the age of 18, marking his first experience in an adult prison. Upon his arrival at Auburn, a large stone prison with steel gates located in a frigid stretch of Upper New York State, Jimmy was greeted by more than a dozen of the prison's toughest inmates, who had been anticipating his arrival. Two of the men approached Jimmy, they were associates of Dominic Chirami and were grateful for his actions on Chirami's behalf. They advised Jimmy that if he encountered any difficulties in Auburn, he should seek their assistance. It was this encounter which would inevitably introduce Jimmy Burke to the mob. Jimmy possessed a remarkable talent for generating income. His prowess was so exceptional that, in an unprecedented arrangement, both the Colombo crime family in Brooklyn and the Lucchese family in Queens agreed to share his services. In 1962, the year Jimmy got married, he discovered that his wife-to-be was being bothered by an old boyfriend. On the day of his wedding, police discovered the remains of the boyfriend, sliced up into over a dozen pieces and tossed all over the inside of his car. Jimmy had three children, his two sons were named Frank James Burke and Jesse James Burke. Now if you didn't know or realize, is that Jesse James and Frank James were two brothers who were among the most notorious outlaws of the American West. In 1966, when he was 23 years old, Henry Hill embarked on his inaugural hijacking. 
Although the trucks were stationary in a garage rather than in transit on the road, the act still constituted a serious grade B felony. Jimmy Burke enlisted Henry's help for the heist after discovering three cargo trucks loaded with home appliances parked in a freight garage near the airport. Jimmy had arranged for a buyer, a friend of Tuddy Vario's, who was willing to pay $5,000 per truck. Jimmy's knack for insider information once again proved invaluable. The garage, with its lax security, had a single elderly watchman on duty on Friday nights, primarily to deter vandalism. During the robbery, Henry easily manipulated the watchman into opening the gate by claiming he had left his paycheck in one of the trucks. After gaining access, Henry subdued the watchman, securing him to a chair in a nearby shack. With Jimmy's precise knowledge of where the truck's keys were and where the trucks were parked, Henry, Jimmy, and Tommy DeSimone quickly navigated the trucks through Canazi to Flatlands Avenue, where Tuddy Vario was waiting. Within an hour, the hijacking crew were en route to Vegas for the weekend, courtesy of reservations Jimmy had secured earlier under false names. In the 1960s and early 1970s hijacking became a profitable venture with few legal consequences. Airlines often preferred to downplay their losses, opting to collect insurance payouts rather than deal with the costs, delays, and inconveniences of increased security. Trucking companies claimed they were powerless against the unions, while the unions argued that the airlines were responsible for not investing enough in driver safety. Complicating matters, New York legislators had not formally categorized hijacking as a distinct crime. As a result, hijackers were typically charged with related offenses such as kidnapping, robbery, gun possession, or possession of stolen property, yet few of these charges resulted in convictions. According to Henry Hill, most of the loads hijacked were sold before they were even robbed, and the customers were often legitimate retailers. Henry Hill also said, Jimmy's first move with the driver involved seizing his driver's license or feigning to record his name and address. Jimmy would emphasize knowing the driver's residence and imply retribution if the driver cooperated with the police in identifying them. Hill also stated that Jimmy's house looked like a department store. He said the basement of the tavern, Robert's Lounge, which Jimmy owned, was so loaded down with stuff that there was hardly enough room to play cards. By the 70s, Jimmy Burke was the king of hijacking at Kennedy Airport, however, with the permission of Big Paul Ivario. Whenever Jimmy required money, he headed to the airport. In the early hours of December 11, 1978, Jimmy Burke orchestrated one of the most audacious heists in American history at the Lufthansa Cargo Building at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City. Jimmy had received a tip from two insiders, Louis Werner and his co-worker Peter Grinwald, who worked for the Lufthansa Cargo Airline. They provided detailed information about a massive haul arriving from Germany, including cash, jewelry, and other valuable items, estimated to be worth millions of dollars. With this valuable information, Jimmy meticulously planned the heist, assembling a crew of trusted accomplices. Alongside Henry Hill, who was eager to prove himself in the criminal underworld, Jimmy recruited Tommy DeSimone, another trusted associate, and his son, Frankie Burke, to join the crew. Frankie served as one of the getaway drivers, playing a crucial role in the operation. One of the individuals involved in the heist was an African-American named Parnell Stax Edwards. He was believed to be one of the drivers during the heist. Two days after the heist, the police discovered the van driven by Parnell Stax Edwards. They found Edwards' fingerprints inside the van, linking him to the crime. This discovery quickly led the authorities to connect Edwards to Jimmy Burke's crew. As a result, the crew came under heavy surveillance by law enforcement, significantly increasing the pressure on them. Amidst the surveillance, Jimmy, known for his paranoia, started to suspect that some of his associates might betray him. To prevent any potential witnesses, Jimmy ordered the murders of several crew members. The crew's criminal activities were now under intense scrutiny, and tensions within the group reached a boiling point. Paul Vario ultimately gave Tommy DeSimone the order to take out Edwards. DeSimone, along with another gangster, Angelo Seppi, tracked Edwards down and fatally shot him on December 18, 1978, as part of the crew's efforts to cover their tracks. In the aftermath of the heist and subsequent murders, chaos ensued. The valuable cargo was never fully recovered, 
and the FBI launched a massive investigation to unravel the events of that fateful night. Despite their efforts, Jimmy and his crew managed to evade capture for several years. The Lufthansa heist became legendary in criminal circles, not only for its scale but also for its repercussions. It solidified Jimmy's reputation as a mastermind of crime and served as a cautionary tale of the dangers of crossing him. The story of the Lufthansa heist was later immortalized in popular culture, including the book Wise Guy by Nicholas Pileggi, which served as the basis for the iconic movie Goodfellas. These portrayals further entrenched Jimmy Burke's role in the heist and its aftermath as a legendary tale of organized crime in America. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, a major college basketball scandal known as the Boston College Point Shaving Scandal unfolded. Jimmy Burke was connected to this scandal through his ties to mobsters Henry Hill and Paul Motze. Members of the Boston College basketball team, including Rick Coon, Jim Sweeney, and Ernie Cobb, conspired with gamblers to manipulate the outcomes of games by intentionally missing shots and committing turnovers. The scheme was uncovered in 1980 when an FBI investigation revealed the player's involvement. In 1980, Burke was arrested for a parole violation. Two years later, in 1982, he was convicted of conspiracy and sentenced to 12 years in prison for his involvement in the point-shaving scandal, primarily based on Henry Hill's testimony. Hill's testimony led to a total of 50 convictions, including those of Burke and Paul Vario. While serving his sentence, Burke was also charged with the 1979 murder of drug dealer Richard Eden. In 1985, he was convicted in a trial where Henry Hill testified against him and was sentenced to an additional 20 years in prison. The scandal had far-reaching consequences, leading to convictions for Coon, Sweeney, and Matze on charges of sports bribery and conspiracy. Cobb, who cooperated with authorities, received immunity. The scandal exposed the dangers of gambling and corruption in sports, and this prompted efforts to prevent similar scandals in the future. Jimmy Burke's life of crime met its end in a stark, unforgiving manner. While serving his sentence in Wend Correctional Facility in Alden, New York, cancer crept into his body, a silent harbinger of mortality. Despite his tenacity, the disease ultimately overcame him. On April 13, 1996, Jimmy Burke breathed his last at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York. His death marked the final chapter in a life defined by crime and deception, leaving behind a legacy of infamy and a cautionary tale of the perils of a life lived outside the law. His name would forever echo as a testament to its dark allure. In American organized crime, 